Hi everybody and a really warm welcome to the British Library food season and our Super Sunday. This is I think the fifth event of the day uh, and we had events all day yesterday and if you've been here with us through any or all of that, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Angela Clutton, I'm the co-director of the food season working with Polly Russell and Melissa Thompson and Joe Allen. Um, we are about to have what I can say with pretty much certainty is going to be a terrific event led by Jonathan Nunn. Uh, Jonathan did one of, sort of the, the most special events for us at last year's season and so when we were programming this year's season it was a bit of a no-brainer to invite Jonathan back um, and you probably don't need me to tell you that Jonathan is the mastermind of Vittles which you know, has become one of a or you know, the most prominent places for food writing and platforming food voices. Um, I think we're in for a great session. I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, there is more to come at the Food Seasons Day after this, if you'd like to stick around. But for now, um, I will hand you over to Jonathan. Thanks so much for coming. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yeah. Sometimes I'm at the back and I can't hear anyone on the stage. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's a great day outside, so um, I know there's a lot of better things you could be doing, but thanks so much for coming here. Um, thanks so much to the British Library as well. Um, this is like becoming like a little bit of an annual thing now, um, but I was very well behaved the last two years, and they've allowed me to talk about restaurant writing now, which is um, my actual specialty. Um, I'm gonna give you a bit of background information as to why I want to talk about restaurants this time. So last September, um, I edited and wrote a book called London Feeds Itself. Um, and in the kind of six months after that, I felt very much like I didn't want to write about restaurants anymore. And... <laughs> yeah, I wasn't gonna written, like, announce my retirement, but like, it was... Um, <laughs> It was just that um, I, I wasn't really feeling inspired by my own writing. I wanted to try and write about um, other aspects of food. And for me, one of the most interesting things about editing that book was the fact that so many essays weren't about restaurants. Um, and for a long time, I didn't really do that much restaurant writing. And um, I, I was kind of coming to terms with some of the ambivalences I had about um, not just the general restaurant writing ecosystem, but my, just the idea of it in general and whether it was actually doing any good. Um, and I guess there's been a few things that have happened which has made this kind of time pivotal, both on like a national level and a personal level of restaurant writing. So um, during the pandemic, um, one thing which hasn't been that reported on is that we lost, I think, three national critics. So Marina at the Times, um, Keith Miller and Catherine Flett at the Telegraph. At the Telegraph, you actually have three critics. Um, and um, one London critic in Faye Mashler. Um, none of those positions have been filled and I don't think they will be refilled. So that's about a third of the um, critical ecosystem gone during the pandemic. Um, and then in uh, February of last year, Eater London, um, which for me was, well, it's the place I started writing. It was the most interesting um, like force for uh, restaurant writing in London, um, shut down. So um, it's kind of a pivotal point for restaurant writing in the city. And then on a personal level, I was in Los Angeles about, about the time um, Eat to London closed, and I kind of just had this sort of, um, not epiphany, but just this feeling that I wanted to come back into restaurant writing and that we should make it a big part of what Vittles does going forward. Um, and um, I think last week was the first uh, newsletter, which is actually part of uh, Vittles Restaurants, which is a new kind of vertical that we're doing. Um, so yeah, that's the reason why restaurants. Um, and we've got a great panel um, here today to talk about uh, different aspects of restaurant writing. I guess kind of um, the kind of very immediate past of it, where it is now and um, its possible futures. So to my direct left, I've got um, Adam Coughlin. 
and um, he was the editor of Eat to London, um, and as of five minutes ago, co-editor <laughs> of uh, Bittles Restaurants. Um, and uh, Nepo baby. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then um, Yvonne Maxwell. Um, Yvonne is um, a polymath, a photographer, uh, writer, um, sometimes restaurant writer as well, um, although you're more ambivalent about it than me. Yes. Um, and uh, Yvonne's work um, in her column at Vittles and elsewhere has regularly covered um, the black communities in London and the UK. Um, and then Furthest to my left, uh, Chitra Ramaswamy, who is a journalist, author, and holds the very unusual title of the Scottish restaurant critic at the Time Scotland. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the unique aspects of that role today. Um, but I'm going to ask you all three the same questions, which is um, for the first question, which is, um, like all of you in the audience, all of you probably have a relationship to restaurant writing. Um, what were your relationships to restaurant writing before you started writing about restaurants? So, Adam. Um, my, I think I started reading the Guardian restaurant review column when I was at university and used to think that, I mean, it, I, re, I, I always, the way I think of restaurant, I, re, I think of restaurant reviews versus other forms of restaurant writing is quite distinct. And I always found that the review was like, I was particularly interested in whether or not that was a good restaurant, but almost always it was a London restaurant. Um, I mean, it was Matthew Norman that I was reading at the time. So it was, I mean, it was, I was reading it, it was an entertainment column, mm. like any other entertainment column that I was reading in, in the weekend newspapers or whatever. Um, so <laughs> I found it l like literally entertaining, and but there were one or two occasions where I it was like service journalism, I, I suppose, is the phrase that we now use, or the phrase that we used at Eater, where it was like a useful piece of information about a, a restaurant that I, um, you know, might have been able to go to. And it, I mean, it happened a couple of times. There was, I think, Matthew Norman once he reviewed like this burrito stand in Manchester Piccadilly. So I was absolutely like, it was like, the, and the price thing was like ten pounds, and like, I was at university, and he gave it ten out of ten. So. There weren't that many occasions where you know there were, he was he was writing about restaurants that I could go to. Um, Did you go there off the back of? Yeah, I went. So I went there off the back of it and went there like all the time. Um, Barbarito, it's called. It's now a massive chain, um, but then it was in. It was like I think it was like the first one that had opened. Um, so yeah, I guess my 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 relationship to it was one of like curiosity, I suppose, and. Um, yeah, finding out like I was very interested to know what, like what what and where was good, but but also just like I found it entertaining. Yvonne? Um, I didn't have any relationship at all, to be very honest with you. Um, it wasn't something I'd ever engaged with from a media perspective to read. Any like any engagement I had with restaurants were usually because I engaged with the communities where those restaurants were housed or people who represented a particular type of you know like cuisine or, or whatever. So. At university, it was engaging with like some of the Greek students that were there, and then discovering like Greek food like through there, and then like the one Greek restaurant that was there, and just being obsessed with it for ages. In London and different parts of London, um, I'm from South London, so um, engaging with like friends who I would probably first experience their cultural cuisine in their homes, and then as I'm walking, I'll be like, oh. Is that, there's a restaurant there that's from where you're from. You know, should we go? And it will be kind of from that perspective. Um, I don't think I really engage with restaurant writing um, until I would say 2018. Yeah, and that was because I had uh, an interest in traveling. And it was actually Eater um, that I first engaged with to understand, like, okay, well, if I'm traveling, like, where, how do I know, like, what is kind of good, what's to stay away from, like, what would be kind of deemed authentic, even though that word is obviously. Yuck. But yeah, what, what, what am I looking for when I travel abroad and, and what does that look like? Was so, it the ETA main sites, like the yeah, US so, ones? Yeah, so ETA yeah. US, because um, obviously they had like, um, yeah, that kind of obviously travel 
um, guides and you know what to eat when you're in New York, what to eat when you're in <coughs> Tokyo and stuff like that. So it was something I engaged with from that perspective. And then I'd usually take that information because I didn't 100 percent trust it. And then I'd then cross reference it with some of like the local bloggers mm. um, and you know the the kind of like cooks and stuff that would be writing online. Um, and I'd then cross reference it with that. And somewhere in the middle, I'll create my own like little guide, basically. But at what point did you start engaging with London restaurant writing? Uh, when you came into my DMs and said, you want to write? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was 2020, I think. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. So, literally not at all. Um, I think the first time I even knew that the, the people that come on to MasterChef were actually the critics. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, you They're know, just some guys. I'm yeah. sure, sure, I'm sure these people are important people. You know? <laughs> it just wasn't something that I engaged with like, at all. And Chitra, before you became um, the critic at the Times of Scotland, mm. what was your relationship? Well, I think I'm a bit older than uh, the, the rest of the panel. So I, I definitely grew up in the era of, you know, A.A. A. Gill probably was the, the sort of the, the Titanic figure. And I certainly did read him, um, but I felt completely kind of divorced from... Um, the world in which he ate and moved around and, and talked about food. And as somebody who, who loved food passionately, um, they didn't really speak to me aside from the kind of the, the architecture of crafting mm. 800 words of copy. Uh, I almost would have read them as a piece of cultural criticism. And actually, as a restaurant critic now, I, I approach it from, from that direction, albeit in a very different way to A.A. Mm. A. Gill. Um, myself, it's, it's quite interesting actually, because so I've been a journalist for about for 20 years and um, it never would have occurred to me that anyone would ask me to be uh, a restaurant critic um, for any newspaper. Um, but then the thing that actually led me to get this job um, was the then editor of the, the lifestyle section of the Times Scotland um, had read a series of pieces that I'd written for The Guardian, because I'm a TV critic and a, a features writer for The Guardian as well. And I had written a, a series of kind of quite light-hearted comedic pieces about the, um, the Bake Off in the era when the Bake Off was absolutely huge and a kind of cultural phenomenon. And she had read those and she phoned me up and she said, you seem like someone who really, really loves food. And the reason I mention that is because I don't think if this particular writer and editor had been sitting in that position of power yeah. at that particular moment in time that I'd be sitting here on this panel today. It really took her to sort of be a reader of my writing and to kind of deduce um, that I was somebody who could bring something to that job um, and to understand that, you know, I love food and that, it, you know, it, it's that very sort of sensitive negotiation of what feels like a diversity hire and what doesn't. Mm. And, um, and she hired me for my, for my writing and my, my knowledge of food and my love of food. Um, and, that, and that feels really important. And I brought a lot of kind of constraints to the role as well, because my children are very young. My remit is Scotland wide um, and, and I don't drive. Um, and my, the older of my two children is autistic, so he's not someone I can kind of drag along to restaurants and, and review with him. So I kind of presented all of this to her and said, listen, these are all the reasons why I can't really do the job in a way, but I would love to. And she was just an amazing editor who said, screw it, Chitra, review during the week at lunchtime. We'll make it work for you, you know? That. Um, and and, and that's, that's how I, I came to the job. But as for my relationship with, with restaurant reviewing before I took the job myself, I would say it was one of kind of, detachment and, uh, and and sort of dislocation really yeah. yeah no dislocation is a good word i because i very much felt like in the last sort of six months that my writing has been dislocated and i think there's um i think the type of writing of describing with a.a gill um very much made for a national audience and like it's very much like a piece of entertainment that anyone in the UK can read and it doesn't really matter like where they're from. But I think all of us have kind of a very like local remit um, and there's this kind of, uh, I think like tension between like writing from a place of, um, writing from a place of home and from like feeling embedded 
and then also writing about someone somewhere that you're new to or somewhere that you're exploring. Um, and f for your role, like you, you're originally from London. How do you negotiate that with like becoming um, a Scottish critic while not being Scottish? Um, yeah, how, how how do you perform that role, and like what are the problems that you've uh, sort of encountered doing that? I think in some ways that's almost my biggest kind of outsider identity coming to the role is not necessarily that I'm the, the second generation daughter of Indian immigrants, it's that I'm an English person mm. and I'm a Londoner. And I feel, I feel hyper aware of that actually, um, down to the kind of nitty gritty of the kind of language that I might use where, you know, a Scottish restaurant critic would insert Scots language um, into a review that I just wouldn't do. Um, but also at exactly that level you talk about, because I, I, I have lived between Glasgow and Edinburgh the whole time that I've been, I've lived in Scotland for longer than I've lived in England now. Um, and so I know Glasgow and Edinburgh very, very well. So I feel local when I'm writing about those restaurants in those cities, I, I can be very hyper-local and I feel very embedded and, and I can, you know, remember the restaurant that was there before that one and the one before that and mm. the one before that and how that particular micro-community might have changed um, and how it's changing still and, and all of that, I think, is in an integral part of um, restaurant criticism. To me, it's writing about place almost as equally as it's writing about food, perhaps as equally and people. It's almost like a kind of 30-30-30 mm. um, split. Um, when I go, when I leave the metropolis, um, and I say this also as a, a, a brown-skinned woman, I'm automatically much more wary of uh, what I'm bringing, the kind of gaze I'm taking with me. Um, and, and I just, I think I have it just inbuilt into my identity because of who I am that I'm always, if, say if I, I did a review recently of a very small, very Scottish, uh, it's called the Wee Restaurant, that's how Scottish it is, um, in, a, in a, um, a little village called North Queensbury, right? And um, as soon as I'm starting to write that, I've got my own kind of critic within me um, on my shoulder, reading, trying to read it at the level of a local who lives in North Queensbury. What might they think about the you know, the, the, the sort of the city slicker jetting in um, and walking up and down the high street a couple of times and then eating in the restaurant and writing about it for the times, mm. which is as mainstream um, and, and in many ways doesn't hold my politics as well. Um, so there's all sorts of negotiations there. So I, yeah, I feel, I feel very aware of those sensitivities and, and, and my remit is nationwide as well as the whole of Scotland. Um, so I feel very at home in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and I feel quite at sea when I go um, beyond those boundaries. And I think it's important to remember that and to go in with that, that spirit. Yeah. Um, Adam, there was, um, I guess, like a similar dynamic with when you started Eat to London. Um, this was like a f one of the first kind of... Uh, sort of big websites which was like designed really for Londoners. I know there's like an aspect like to like when you go to a city you have like a tourist list and like the 38 yeah. kind of functions as a tourist list. But I felt that from from the beginning and certainly after the first year of like mm. Eat to London, it, this was like turning into like a site for Londoners for themselves. But then of course there's also like the tension of uh, like which Londoners and uh, who is writing on like behalf of Londoners. So can you talk a bit about like, I guess like, your remit when Eater London started and what you were yeah, like, trying I mean, to do? I think, I mean, in a very, very broad sense, what we were trying to do was something different, um, which, and I think what that means or what that meant to me was like get some like, can we find out, can we talk about places that not, not everyone else is talking about? Or if we are talking about those places, then maybe we can offer a little bit extra or a different perspective. And I think it wasn't all that conscious, actually. But I just think because of the, 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 the dynamic of the, the way I and we were covering things and the way in which we were choosing to write about stuff, and, the th and I think the sort of brand DNA that we taken from ETA in the US, which was quite kind of, 
you know, it was sort of like hostile, like cynical, like, you know, sometimes quite like deliberately provocative, mischievous, whatever, like all those sorts of things. Like you never to start to sort of generate an interest from people who, okay, we can, you know, maybe, maybe they, maybe they might want to hear from me. Um, and you, I don't know, it's like an ecosystem in itself. Like if you, if you start to sort of exhibit values, you start to generate interest from certain types of writers and people. And what, I've, it, what quickly became apparent to me was, I don't know, like I wanted to hear from like, a, like younger, like more like disparate and diverse voices. Um, and I think one of the best things that, that, that you were able to do, I think, that not a lot of publications in London have ever really managed to do is like, and it's, you know, obviously you went on to write this, the book and like the subject of this talk. Like you were, you were writing about restaurants from the perspective of being a Londoner. And like very few London re like restaurant writers had ever really done that before. And I think that was one of the big things that like made a difference. And it started to speak, like Eat to London started to speak to a different type of, like of many different types of communities um, because um, because we were I think you were, we were we were we were sort of thinking about where we were and what we were what we were actually trying to do and um, do stuff that um, other other publications weren't Yvonne, do you um, I remember talking to you when I think I was writing the Peckham map in 2020 2021 something, something like that it was 2021, yeah. Yeah, and um, that was, I remember you being slightly sceptical, because <laughs> um, I, I was only a South Londoner by that point for about three years, and I had been waiting to like get the nerve to write a Peckham app. Because so I knew that <laughs> if it wasn't, cause Peckham's been a place which has been badly written about so many times that even like someone living there, like I, one, it's like it's still, I didn't grow up there. It's not necessarily my place to write about yet, but that it had to be right. Um, and it had to be um, a local there, or a native as you would put it, um, had to like read that piece and like find it truthful. Um, what I wanted to ask was, in your view, have, have the kind of, reviews and maps of places that you know or like you would call home have you generally found them to be truthful um or even even if they're like diverse lists of restaurants like maybe written by people who aren't white have you generally found them to be accurate or or truthful uh no actually i think the peckham map that you wrote like you say i was skeptical when am i not skeptical but hey um I was skeptical, and not because I doubted you, because I've, I've read your writing, I'm a huge fan, um, but more of the boldness it takes to speak of a place, to speak to a place of truth, like about these places and these communities, right, that have been tarred with just so much rubbish. Um, and speak so negatively of people who have literally held those places together for generations, made it something that is now worthy of, you know, people coming and sitting in rooftop bars and so on, mm. right? Um, those, places, those people are still there. You know, you may not see them, but they're still there. And for me, your peck and map, I remember, you know, messaging you going, yeah, like this is, this is good. Um, I'm really, I felt it. I was like, I know this place, I know this place. I, can, I even saw the route that I was walking to go to all of these places and how I would hit each one or as many impossible, you know, as possible in one day and what that looks like. I'd been to pretty much, I think, 90% of those places already. Um, some people, some of those I've been going there since I was a kid. And it was <laughs> truthful, you know? And I think all the other maps that I have seen that do tend to engage with... Um, you know, these kind of very, I think you said micro communities. Um, and I like that. I might steal it. <laughs> but these micro communities um, or touch them, I find that they just don't have 
the boldness to speak to a place of truth. They may include like one or two, and that's usually because, well, you have to mention these or else did you even go to this area? Mm. Um, Brixton is a perfect example when people talk about, you know, where to get Caribbean food in Brixton. You know, it's like when, when you speak of that place, there are so many. And even the boundaries of Brixton, what do you class as Brix Brixton? Right, it's, it's a lot bigger than we think. It's not just this little kind of strip of high street. Similar when you look at Camden. You know, what do you class as Camden? It's not just the high street. There's so much. And there's all these other, like, little residential um, things happening in the smaller kind of communities, estates. Do you go there? Probably not. Do you walk there? Probably not. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's, it's that. They're just not bold enough to speak from a place of truth. But that's also because often those people are not bold enough to actually engage with those communities. Get out of your zip car and <laughs> go to these places. Walk on foot to these places you know, sit down, speak to somebody, engage, and maybe go a few times, not just the once, because how do you really get a feel for a place, you know? You don't go to, you know, to Paris and say, I've seen the Eiffel Tower, I now, I now know Paris. You don't. You have to go there, and each time you go, you see something different. Some things will be beautiful, some things will not be beautiful, um, but that's all part of the truth of this place, right? And I think that's what it is, is like these people just don't have the boldness to really dig in and say, what is this place about, you know, beyond this just one restaurant that I think ticks my box or that I think my editor would like or mm. that is within my comfort level? What, what is it? Do you think this is one of, like, the big sort of pitfalls of... And I, it's not just maps, but, like, I think maps kind of... Maybe the format of them, it, it, like, leads to this. It can happen with reviews as well. But you get, you get this kind of... Um, sense of like this is just a place to be you've got 15 places to tick off and then maybe the writing is like a paragraph long therefore like you're just going to sort of tick off and not really engage with it on a on a yeah. bigger level than that yeah it's the limitations of restaurant writing essentially right mm. it's you know you've got this amount of words to you know to cover you know your editor said okay we need about 15 places okay great but how much like negotiation is that writer doing like, you know, if you, you know, you're like, okay, I want you to talk about this. And I'll say, mm, well, actually, can I also add this? And can I add this? And, and you're an editor that I can, like, work with and collaborate with because this piece truly has to represent me. Mm. Otherwise, I definitely can't write about it. And, and we've spoken, spoken about that many times. But it's, it's, again, it's like, if this is just a job, right, and you've got your aspirations and you're just trying to, you know, tick your boxes and, and do your job, again, for me, I feel like there's actually a social responsibility to this job. And if you don't see it in that way then one can argue maybe it's, you're not doing it well. <clears throat> you know, so it's, it's that. It's when you speak of, um, you know, that responsibility and that duty to represent that, that local as opposed to just kind of, like you say, walking up and down the high street. It's, it's engaging from that level. The fact that you even hold that in your brain, which I suspect because of your background and who you are, that you're, like, hyper-conscious of that, similar to me. I'm not going to walk into an area that I don't know anything about, but there are other people who don't, have an issue with that. So, a good thing at, to, um, to go into, actually, I guess the social responsibility of the restaurant writer, and there's one phrase which gets repeated by one critic in particular, but it's actually a phrase which I've seen a lot of times, is that the job of a restaurant writer or restaurant critic is to generate sales for the paper, like to sell papers. I've always found that quite like a kind of quite asinine point, like, of course it is, like, of course like the base goal of writing is to kind of get people to read it, but there, there has to be something else. Like, what, Adam, for you, like, what is the, as, as editor as well, like, what is the function for you of like any map or review apart from telling, sub, apart from telling one to generate <coughs> like page clicks, but all, uh, and beyond just telling somewhere where to go to, what's the function of that? Um, I think, um it was about, um, I mean, it's about storytelling. And I think journalism, and I think from what both Yvonne and Chicho have been saying, one of the fundamental problems within food media in, in Britain, like historically, like with the odd exception, is that there are the principles of journalism and, and like rich storytelling haven't been applied to food writing in the way that like it has been in America. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons why it, it lacks something. It's 
When you, th- you were talking before about, like, you care about the people whose business you're writing about, the people that are going to go there. Like, restaurant reviews in Britain are basically about the writer themselves. Mm. And, like, that l- a lot of people love that. Because, like, I mean, Tim Dowling had a column in The Guardian for, like, how long? I mean, still people, has it. He's still got it, yeah. Right, okay. But that is the same sort of thing. Like, people like checking in on a regular basis with, like, a human being. Mm. But, I mean, for me, that's, like extremely like one dimensional and, 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 and not, not, not all that it doesn't serve a, a huge function. Um, but what, we, what, do, what the, the point for me is like, I wanted to improve the way people ate, not just tell them where to go. It was like, are we gonna materially improve like your experience and the, ex- like, the way that you interact with different neighborhoods and different communities, like understand your city. That was what it became about when you know i think and that's i think what i liked so much about your writing and the way that we were able to editorialize maps because maps can be very, you know copywriting you can just have a list of places and anyone can write the entries but you can actually turn them into a piece of journalism as well like you did exactly i wrote peckham was in my in my notes so is the milkshakes map which is another <laughs> example <laughs> does anyone remember that <coughs> The deep cut. That was around the time um, when Nigel Farage was milkshaked, and it became a form of um, protest. We we did a we did a map on the best milkshakes and the best milk-based dairy-based drinks in London. But it was like based on throwability. <laughs> yeah, well, based. Like, <laughs> so that's I'm um, you know being a little bit facetious, but Peckham was a really good example of like you told the story of of of, of, a, of, a, of an area and of a community and and, and the, the many communities that that, that coexisted there. In a, in a way that was also in direct, like, it was in dialogue with all the garbage that had come before it. Um, so, yeah, for me, that's, the, that's really the point of it. Chitra, what do you see as the function of the, the review? And, and actually, the social responsibility as well. Does, does the critic have any responsibility apart from the responsibility to their editor and to the reader? Yeah, I... <laughs> I should probably have sense of uh, responsibility to my editor, but I have none whatsoever. <laughs> um, sorry, Anne. <laughs> That's the whole point. Um, yeah, I, I, it's such a fascinating question. Um, and I, I think my responsibility is kind of split in so many ways, um, partially towards the reader. Um, and by that, I mean that sort of classic journalistic imperative that you want them to read the first sentence and get to the last one. Um, so that's just kind of hardwired into me as a, as a journalist. Um, but also to the restaurant itself, um, I think is, and it increasingly with just the dire situation that restaurants are in in this, this country for all the reasons that I don't need to go into that everyone will know, I feel like that responsibility is increasing. So I feel that since I've done, done this job, I came into it sort of just before the, the pandemic and now, of course, the energy crisis and staff shortages and everything. Um, I, feel, I feel that responsibility increasing. Um, I also, I think it's really interesting when I think about my, my own readers, the Times reader, and, you know, one doesn't want to generalise, but I do, for example, that there are restaurants that maybe how can I put this sensitively, that I wouldn't necessarily want to send Mm. your average Times reader to. It might be too small, or there might be issues around a kind of cultural sensitivity. um, And so that would also influence what restaurant I might and might not review. I I try and review as kind of widely and across the board as possible, um, as is within my... um, capacity and again I come back to these ideas of, of the, the constraints because they're sort of they're becoming more and more interesting to me and I think when I started doing the job I felt a lot of um, guilt about not being a more kind of free unencumbered person who mm. could just you know that that lovely wandering romantic ideal of just kind of walking the city all day I just can't do that um, because of the, the stage of life that I'm in and because I'm a mother and, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why, why I can't do that. And so I think I felt guilty about that up to a point and then I suddenly thought, do you know what? That is actually feeding the work 
and the constraints are part of the reason why I review a certain place at a certain time, and that's okay, because we all live like that. Um, and that's part of the reason why restaurant criticism can and should and needs to change, that I'm not A.A. Gill or um, Tim Dowling, although he's not a restaurant critic, but you know what I mean, that, that kind of free, unencumbered white man who can just kind of move around the world with such ease. It's not my story, so why would I be aiming for that? Um, it's maybe coming slightly off, off topic, but to, to me, the responsibility is, is split between you know, reader, restaurant, and, and to some degree myself, actually, as well. Um, and, and I do I completely agree with uh, your focus on, on storytelling. Um, I do think a really, really good piece of restaurant criticism should be a, a, a bloody good yarn, you know? It should, it should be a story with a kind of a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and, and I try and bring in, I often notice as I'm, you know, try, writing to deadline that I'll be kind of 500 words into my 800 word review and I haven't actually tasted anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit, you know, I better, better, better kind of bring one of these <coughs> up a bit higher. Um, but actually, I think that's okay. I think it's okay to get 500 words in and to have talked maybe a little bit about the history of maybe the community that is the reason why uh, that restaurant is in a particular place at a particular time. That, if anything, that's my preoccupation. Why is this restaurant here now? Um, and um, what can I say about it? I think that's actually one of the similarities of like, is that through line of like British restaurant criticism. Because A.A. Gill would write 790 words before getting to the actual restaurant. <laughs> um, but it's like the idea that this isn't, no one wants to read a description of food. Like, there's not much worth in like 800 words just about sort of food descriptions that there has to be something else. And for him, it was himself. And f for you, it's, it's, it's other things, it's community. Um, but something you said um, about your kind of positionality, uh, one as a woman, as a person of color, um, and the readers, and maybe think of something you told me Yvonne about following like lists abroad. I think, was it Mark Weems or yeah. was it Bourdain? Uh, I mean, probably both. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but like this idea that like you can put together a list and like if you are a white man or just for me, just a, a guy, um, put you, you often, I think people put together lists don't imagine the constraints for people who aren't like them or for like what someone following this list might experience if they are not exactly the same as you. And I'm very lucky in that I, I actually think it's a kind of a benefit that I'm not white because I'm kind of ethnically ambiguous that I kind of get welcomed in most restaurants um, and, and that I, n I never really feel that I'm not at home. Or like I'm not like welcome. Mm. Um, whereas for you, it, it, you, you've had very different experiences following lists by made by men. Definitely, definitely. So um, I think solo travelling is obviously going to be something that's challenging for for most women because of safety and stuff. But as a visibly black woman um, travelling anywhere, following these lists, I've had like just yeah very harrowing experiences. Um, in, we were following, my husband and I were traveling through um, East Asia and we went to um, the Philippines as one of our stop-offs. And we literally were like, I think we went to the Chinatown in the Philippines and um, following, I think there was a group of us who were not together, we just all happened to be following the exact same list. <laughs> um, and we didn't realize until I think like the third restaurant in basically, and we're like, hey, where to? <laughs> um, And like, you know, the, thir the first one was fine, second one was okay. Third one, you know, still welcomed. By the fourth one, um, uh, like the, the kind of reception between us and the other people who, we, by this point, we all now were like, okay, well, we're heading to this next. Um, you know, they were definitely welcomed a lot warmer than we were. And we were like, oh, that's fine. We're still eating food. By the time we got to the, the final one, um, we were like point blank refused entry. Um, so they were just like, no. Like the lady was just like, no, turned her back. And we were like, uh, but we just want to, no get out, no, no, and it was just, yeah, so, and so there's just moments like that where I think the realities of um, a food lover trying to engage with um, the, the kind of 
the outputs that come out of food media um, and just how jarring that can sometimes be when applied in reality to somebody who doesn't look like um, the writer, who isn't white, who isn't male. Um, yeah, I think sometimes that can be uh, quite a, an aggressive reality to be faced with, especially when abroad as well. Um, and it's, it's definitely not been, I've had issues, same, same um, issues that I've had in London too, Soho restaurants kind of like not be like being very hostile um, and then seeing, you know, white groups of people walking through and being like, oh, just me then, sure. Um, you know, and I think I wrote about it in my kind of restaurant mm. when I was talking about, yeah, a kind of restaurant writing piece and just having to grapple with whether to kick up a fuss or not, whether to, you know, cause an argument, whether to make a scene. Uh, if I do, who, who would care? Like, what would that look like? What do you think, the, is there a way of writing about these places to like mitigate against that? I think, um, I would say yes. So going on the same example of Mark Weens, um, he's a YouTube blogger. There's something that he does um, is that he speaks so highly of the people who are serving him. And it's like, well, of course, they're going to treat you amazingly. You've got a humongous following. But he always goes, oh my God, uncle and auntie, they're so nice. They're so lovely. Come here, they're amazing. And it's like, to you. And it's, it's almost, but, but, but that's that blindness, you know? And I think that that's where that, that's where that word privilege comes into it. And it's literally just saying, I can speak about this place without attributing, you know, characteristics that may only apply to me and say, actually, the food is good. Service seemed good as well. Like, and that's why, you know, ratings like, you know, one to five, those things, I think sometimes strip things out a little bit. Mm. So when I go in there, I'm not expecting for the, you know, this auntie and uncle who are dishing out noodles to be clapping and welcoming in, in the door, you know? So when I don't get that, I'm now not disappointed. I can then put it down to my normal lived experience and say, okay, guess this place is racist, not coming here again. Or it's racist, but the noodles were banging and I might still come. I have to some serious to get noodles. <laughs> listen, it was like my whole entire experience in Hong Kong. I was like, I'll definitely come again, but at least I know what I'm getting myself into. <laughs> it's like, but I'll definitely go again, you know. So it's, it's that, like, it's, it's at least that way I can prepare myself. And I think that's the experience that a lot of... Um, you know, white writers are not seeing is that, white food writers are not seeing is that I have to mentally prepare myself when I'm stepping into a space. I have to think before I go in, you know, am I going to be like pulled up on how I'm dressed, you know, and, and how I'm dressed is the same as how you're dressed, but it's going to be a bit different for me. And then when we look at places um, like there's, you know, very known, um, you know, London restaurants like the Ivy, for example, where they have a very racist policy when it comes to dress sense and sorry, dress, like dress policies and so on. And countless, countless videos of black diners or, or, or you know, expectant diners kind of going, I've just been you know, told I can't get in, look at what I'm wearing. They said it's because of this. And then they're taking like videos of other people, you know, white diners who are walking in and who are dressed just, you know, just the same. And it's that, that thing, it's that experience that often just gets missed out that would be good if, if there was some recognition mm. of what that experience could be. Um, and worst case scenario, if you, can't put, your sh if you, put, you can't, can't put yourself in my shoes, then take yourself out of yours. Mm. Like, just step out of yours and write from a place as much as possible um, of neutrality um, and just speak the facts. Was it good or not? I, you know? I also think as well as caveating recommendations with the fact that these owners are racist or whatever. You should also just write, you should have enough, as, well, from my perspective as an editor, you, this is why you want representation among your contributors. Because you just, you end up getting pay, people that, you write about different places. And it means that people aren't being served recommendations where they might have enter, encountered problems. And like, that's what I think I was talking about before, about you can, you can affect the whole ecosystem by, the point from which you start. So if you start like trying to like you you start getting people to give you recommendations, you start talking to a different audience, and then the whole conversation changes. Like the reason these places are getting coverage is because someone else, has, another white guy, has already written about it yeah. and made it bigger and better, and they've got more money. And then the rest, of, you know, it's like a it's a self fulfilling thing. So one of the great things I go and I keep coming back to you, like you were writing about pla different places. You just, I don't know, you can change the conversation as well as have to put an asterisk against yeah. these, these, this decent noodle joint. I think it was also... I th yeah, sorry. sorry go I was going to say also, like, I think sometimes these publications don't realise 
that someone else that isn't there might read it mm. as well. So they're not even so that, so that restaurant who, you know, I could have discovered that Soho restaurant through the piece that all these other white people are walking in and eating, you know, but it's that, it's that expectation. Well, no, no, this, we're not writing for you. Mm. We're writing for this person and this, mm. per, this type of person will go to this type of place. So if that type of place is used to that type of person, when someone else who isn't that type of person walks in, even they are having to kind of face a reality that they were not expecting as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I was just, to, to bring to that, my perspective is I am almost, you know, the, the outsider operating or infiltrating the mainstream because I'm, op I'm, I'm in an extremely mainstream space. So I'm not really necessarily going out and, and looking for, you know, the, the restaurants that haven't been reviewed yet. I am the outsider going to the, the yeah. places that have already been <laughs> reviewed. And, um, and service is a fascinating one because although I've done this job for, for three years and I'm certainly the only brown-skinned um, restaurant critic in, in Scotland and, well, you, you mentioned to me... Um, I, I think you're the only, you think, um, yeah, the you. only national restaurant um, critic um, who isn't white. Yeah, in history. Yeah. Um, so you would think in some ways that I would, by this stage, having done the job every single week in Scotland um, for three years, that I would now walk into a restaurant and people would be like, oh, that must be Chitra, um, and that they would know. What's so interesting about doing a job that has literally never been done by someone who looks like me before is I am completely invisible. No one ever literally looks at me and thinks, oh, that middle-aged Indian woman must be a restaurant critic because it is beyond the bounds mm. of possibility for anyone to hold that extraordinary <laughs> thought in their head. Um, so it means that when I sit down and, and, I, and I obviously go anonymously and I book under an anonymous name, um, no one thinks that I'm doing this job. Even now, I've, I've, I've never been rumbled, and, and I can't imagine I will be until, you know, another 100 years when the culture's changed. Um, so there are, there are kind of benefits to that in a way, because I'm, I'm really experiencing the, the, the sort of the, the real service, not the service that the privileged white man gets, but the service that people like me um, get. So I, th I think there are benefits to it, but, but it is also kind of distressing. We've got um, about 15 minutes for questions, um, both in here and I think online as well, um, although I don't have the iPad. Just in here, <laughs> I, I've got. I've still got questions if there aren't enough. Yeah. I want to still talk about gatekeeping, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Hi. Um, so I think on similar lines of what you were talking about, about, you know, the ethnic ambiguity and your identities, which is, you know, cultural and ancestral versus your lived identity or geographical identity. Do you think it also affects your credibility? Because you spoke about service, you spoke about, you know, how you sort of tackle that. But um, for a reader, do you think it affects your credibility or does it work as a strength? I, that's a really interesting question. I don't read my below the line comments very much because, you know, Times readers. Um, <laughs> but um, when I do, it is a big mixture, actually, of, you know, people saying, who gave this woman this job? She hasn't got a clue. Um, to, interestingly, because, you know, the, the, my sort of national um, other half, uh, if you like, is Giles Corrin. I mean, we could not be more different. Um, so then there's also the, the, the sort of people who are saying, this, thank God that this isn't Giles Corrin. You know, she, this, this girl should do this more often. Um, so I get, I get that as well. Um, so I think for some, for, for some, your credibility increases, in fact, because you're offering something that hasn't been offered before. Um, and for others, yeah, you're just seen as, why, why is this person doing this job? There's, I mean, some of the worst, uh, some of the worst restaurant writing I've read are people writing stuff about, like I guess their own food from their own ethnicity. Some of the worst Indian restaurant writers are Indian. Um, I, I don't think. I think. Um, I mean, for me, I could 
to some extent write about going food in London from a position of some knowledge, but that knowledge is very specific. That's knowledge of me being the son of uh, a mother who came here in the 1970s, specifically through East Africa, um, that my um, knowledge of going food is mainly through familial celebrations, which is a different kind of food to the food that gets served in restaurants. So you can't like, for me, like if you want to be credible, you can't just rest on your laurels as like, oh yeah, like I, I come from this place. Um, you, you have to do the work, I think. Um, and um, I mean, yeah, we, we've been talking about like people who do the work. Like, th th there's lots of people who kind of rest on their laurels. It's like I'm like I'm from here, therefore I don't really have to put in the work. No, but you, you yeah, you definitely do. Um, there's a uh, that's such a good point. There's a double standard at work, isn't there? That I think you know, for example, I would be expected to to be the authority on the entirety of, uh, of Indian cuisine in Scotland. Um, whereas really what I know about is, uh, is South Indian cuisine, um, of which there is not that much in Scotland um, for, for sort of complicated reasons that we haven't got time for here. But um, whereas a, a, um, a white restaurant critic would not have those same expectations, I think. So I think there are double standards at work there. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Um, yeah. Well, there's a. Uh, oh, oh, do uh, you first, and then and then you. Um, I know Chicho touched on this a bit, but just the question of like how you navigate who you are bringing to a restaurant by writing about it or by being an editor of you know a list of say the Peckham list, like who. For example, I guess this is slightly more for Adam. Like, I think you would agree that somewhere like Eater or like Vittles is can be quite dominated by quite a like middle class comes to the British Library food season audience. And I think, yeah, are there ever Litty. points where you're Litty like, is the <laughs> yeah, li exactly. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, whether you've ever thought actually, I don't know if I'm being responsible by including this restaurant or writing about it in this way. Yeah, th this is a gatekeeping question. Um, me, me and Yvonne have had, a, I mean, many discussions about this, specifically about one restaurant, which I would like to be written about more, but Yvonne thinks shouldn't be written about, or at least, like, there's um, a... wondering if there's a way of writing about it responsibly. But, I mean, Yvonne, like, do, do you think there are restaurants that shouldn't be written about? Um, I, would, I would say still say yes. I do think that there are restaurants that shouldn't be written about. Um, but it is, it's, it's complicated and, and I am always aware that I don't want to make that decision on behalf of those restaurants. Um, but I also have seen in real time um, establishments, um, areas, communities being completely dismantled because of gentrification and many other things. So when writing about these places, it's really difficult to say to, you know, your readers, okay, great, it's, it's a really small place, so just don't, don't all just run there, you know? It's, it's just definitely not gonna happen, right? It's, you're definitely gonna, gonna get the cues, and, and for me, it's more that kind of responsibility that the diner now has, which is, you go to a place, the food is banging, it's great, but the service is a bit slow, they're clearly not equipped for the amount of people that are now coming there. So things are just a little bit haphazard. You might have to remind them for a little while that, you know, oh, my food is still here. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. You then run to Google or whichever place, do your negative review. Slowly that then amounts to so many negative reviews. That restaurant is now tanking. They're now struggling at something that they were once absolutely phenomenal and excellent for the people that they aimed to serve, mm. right? For the community and the size of the group that they aim to serve. And then you then have the other side of that type of restaurant, which is also a restaurant that has a very specific context. So this restaurant that I'm like fighting for Jonathan not to write about. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and fired. I know that you've slipped it in a couple of times. Or you've definitely <laughs> mentioned it a few times. But this restaurant that I'm literally like fighting for my life to not make it onto the streets of Vittles 
um, is because even I am a visitor there. I've been going there, like my family and I, we've been going there for many, many years, but we are still visitors there. We're now, we, we're now seen as part of the community who are there, but it's not for us. It is literally like older members of that community, they all go there like at varying times, different parts of that community go there at different times. Sunday is the church crowd, Saturday is the just before I go out you know, for my night out crowd, and they're all from this community. What would happen if suddenly you, you're going from a Sunday after church in your Sunday best, heading to this restaurant that you've been going to for 10, maybe 15 years, right? Every single Sunday. And it's, there's no seats now. It's now filled with white people. You now don't have a place in this, in this space that is actually for you, where you don't have to say, don't make it too spicy. You don't have to say, oh, actually, there's a bit too much oil on this. You just go, oh, yeah, make me my food. It's there, and it will arrive, and it'll be fine. What, what happens to that person now if they can't go to this place that they love, that they've been going to? Like, what, where do they go? And when you're done with that place, because you will be, because a new place will get written about, what now happens to that community? What now happens to that restaurant? It's changed forever. Because there are things that a Western diner, a, West, a London diner, a white London diner will be requested and expecting. Look at the, 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 the reputation of Caribbean takeaways, for example. There are things that you guys expect of places that are not held to the same level of importance to some communities. And without that context of knowledge and understanding of these communities that have existed in London, in the UK for generations, without doing that work to actually understand the context in which these people operate and live daily, you're always going to jar the status quo. You're always going to step in and break something. You know, that's how it's always going to be until you understand. You know that if you are in a... A, a traditional Japanese restaurant and they tell you to take off their, your shoes, you're going to do it, you know. But if you step into a West African restaurant and they say, well, this thing you eat with your hands, you're going to be like, I'm not sure. This thing is made with this amount of pepper. It's called pepper soup. Oh, it's a bit spicy. It's in the name. You should expect it, <laughs> you know. It's, it's these things. It's, it's without that context, without you guys doing the work, I don't need to do the work. I know you all. I've been in England for many years. So if you guys don't do the work to understand the, 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 the nuances of these cultures and how they exist, how things are served, I'll say authentically, knowing that things can move away from that central point of authenticity, then you don't have a baseline of understanding. And you'll go by your baseline of understanding. And then that's what, that's what breaks things. Um, the I mean, a brilliant answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the exact question you ask is, I'm sure, like the questions that you ask with your editor, the one that I'm currently asking with Adam. Um, specific because, like, I've never done reviews before. I've always been writing about groups of restaurants and the effect that a positive write up can have is slightly mitigated by the fact that I might be writing about 20 places at once. But in a review, it's, it's a different matter. So like, this is, I mean, I, I brought up the three places I would like to write about first. One of them is uh, something which is very local and dear to me and would be a place that I would not want to see overrun. And you have to weigh up the, the there's a trade of like, as soon as you write about something, you change it. Like it's like the Schrodinger principle. Um, you do change it. And it, it's the trade off between like, is this, should you write about this place because it is important, it's important to the city and it's important that we kind of learn from this place versus I shouldn't write about it because um, it could be changed in ways that I can't foresee. Uh, and I would say yes to both of those, but then there's this middle point which is taking your reader who you should know you should take them on a journey. Mm. You have to and, know and, the reader. And and yeah. You have to know your reader and you have to know whether they can be trusted there. Mm. And, that's, and that's the point. And if, they, if you feel like at this point they can't, it means that that one is part for them maybe later. Mm. You know? and, and, and then you then take them on that journey. I've been approached by many publications to be like, oh, can you write about this? And I'm like, my voice is not for your readers right now. Yeah, yeah. It's just not. 
and I'm not going to change my voice. So when you've done your social experiment and you change your readers, <laughs> then maybe we can talk. But that's, but that's it. It's like, it's until you have taken them on that journey, then, and maybe even a piece could even be written about who we think we're writing for mm. and just really confronting that, you know, and unpacking what that looks like. I think that's probably the piece to write first and then maybe you can write about the, <laughs> the restaurant. But yeah, like as in, I think, I think that's the piece to write first. It's just taking them on that journey first mm. to let them know like this is, because we know that London has existed in a constant state of change. Every major city has essentially, but in every country has, but it's, it's, it's trying to get people to really sit with what that change looks like, who it impacts, because um, it's never going to be your reader that it impacts. Um, got time for just one quick question, one quick answer, I think, because um, it is 4.30. Um, I wanted to ask. Sorry, I didn't actually know if this is working. I wanted to ask about eating or dining alone. So what you just said resonates with me a lot. But then I think about places where people go, and you see like a large crowd of people that are often quite disrespectful to the people that are actually working there and servers. Um, when I think about reading reviews um, of restaurants, I'm more tempted to go by myself. And I think that, I wonder if that has anything to do with like how those spaces can still kind of remain, um, not necessarily closed off, but just a bit more respectful when you are approaching some of these restaurants just by yourself. And I wonder if you had any thoughts on intimate eating outside. Um. As in, like, what approach you should have when you're you're going into a restaurant and, and by yourself, and um, one to see yourself as a guest, um, not and f for me, like the um, one problem I think like some people have with like going into restaurants by themselves, and, and maybe I had this. I guess like when I was a teenager is like feeling out of place. Um, but, but I often think that kind of feeling of um, being in London and it not being, I guess, home ground for you um, can for some people be a really uncomfortable feeling, more uncomfortable than going away or go going on a holiday and like being in a, in a foreign restaurant. When, it, when it's actually in your city, some people find that really, really uncomfortable. Um, and my advice is always to like lean into that feeling because that's fine. But like, you don't have ownership of like everything in your city. Like, um, the, I think like the, the approach you should come into is like that you are a guest in, in someone else's home. And, and then from that point, like, and, and then once there's a kind of connection like that you, you can have some kind of like stewardship like almost over it, but you, you never have ownership over it. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. I would agree. Yeah, um, I think that's it. I think, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, thank you so much. <laughs>